Good morning, Manchester, and to those of you in the surrounding towns, welcome to Hour 3 of Gerard Large, a very special hour for us here as we are with Superintendent Tom Brennan, the outgoing superintendent of Manchester Schools. You can find us on the web at GerardAtLarge.com, and you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, also at Gerard at Large, and I suspect my able social media staff is now posting to Twitter and Facebook the fact that you are in studio so that uh, we can broaden our audience as much as possible so we can hear your parting thoughts and words. Good morning, Mr. Superintendent. Thank you for joining us here on Gerard at Large. Good morning, Rich. Good to be here. Thank you. Now, Tom, uh, I, w- I was noticing, uh, uh, you know, that y- you, don't, you don't exactly seem to be a, a happy guy right now. So it's it, – are you – what, as, as you come up on your, your last uh, couple days of work here in the district, uh, of course, June 30th is officially your last day, which is right. Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts and feelings? Well, I, I, I don't know what happened this morning, but I, when I woke up, I just didn't feel, uh, I don't know if the word is bittersweet or whatever, but uh, reflecting on my, my tenure here, I wish I had been able to accomplish more. Um, I wish I had been able to do more. Uh, and, and I'm not putting the blame uh, in one category. As I often say, we can all stand in a circle and point to the left. <laughs> you know, that's, that's where we are. Uh, so it was just a moment and, and actually a couple of hours of self-reflection that said, darn, I wish I could have done this. I wish I could have done that. There's still things unfinished. But it, and also, I think the district, believe it or not, is in a great place. Uh, you mentioned the audit earlier, uh, the incoming superintendent. Uh, the changing culture, I believe, among the board members. Uh, there are a lot of things that seem to be going in the right direction as I step off the train. But uh, as I've also said, I've carried too many heavy bags with me and might slow down that process. So I guess that's what I was reflecting this morning. Now, wh- what are some of the things that um, you wished you had accomplished and why don't you think you were able to do it? I I really pride myself in being able to communicate with people and, and creating relationships. And the one relationship that was probably is probably the most important to a superintendent of schools is that with the, the board of school committee. And I never seem to be able to get there. Uh, and I would attribute that to a lack of trust on, on my part uh, as far as – Did you come into the job with a lack of trust? I don't think so. I came, no, I came into the job that I – I thought with the skill that I thought I had uh, would enable me to to break down any of that uh, concern or distrust or what have you. What I experienced was uh, typically in other districts when I worked there, you could talk to a group of board members and try to develop a strategy and working together. And on several occasions here when I spoke to board members, my words were either misinterpreted uh, accidentally or deliberately or uh, turned against me. And so I was very reluctant to, to really talk about things. And that's also extended to the administration. Sometimes, you know, if someone doesn't like something that I share, they share it with the board and the board puts a twist on it. And then showtime comes, uh, TV lights go on and it's a, it's very un- a very uncomfortable situation. So... I don't know if that makes sense, but no, that's... it 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 does, and I don't know if you want to get into sort of examples or naming names of particular no. issues or problems, but you know when you started, <clears throat> was it five years ago now? Yes, there there were certain promises made to you that um, were were broken right off the bat. What were those? I think the most critical uh, was the the fact that uh, the uh, central office, we were going to have two assistant superintendents, uh, three actually, but two more were going to be added, uh, one at each level, elementary, and then one at middle high, uh, similar to the the way it was when I was back here in 99, 98. And uh, within days, uh, that was eliminated. The budget was eliminated. Uh, So... Now that was that a condition of your hiring? Is that you said? Hey, listen, we thought so. We need to do this. All three of us, the, the three candidates at the time, said the same thing. Uh, there was a short period of time in which that was on the budget or in the budget, and um, came back to a meeting and they were gone. So uh, I think that began uh, to a certain extent. Okay, now what's going to happen? You know, what's going to happen next? Uh, 
And I, I do do need to uh, say something about Assistant Superintendent Burkish because, uh, as I often tell people, if it were not for her, I would have been one and done for me uh, because of her strength and her knowledge and uh, understanding of the district. Uh, and that was a tough couple of years when there's just the two of us uh, working, trying to work as hard as we could and not seem to get get out there. The other, you know, and uh, last night at the audit, some of the things that we've been talking about, the need to expand the central office position uh, positions is critical. Well, you know, I've been in the tank on that one for mm -hmm. a while. But yes. uh, Mayor Gatz has brought up a point last night when he got to ask questions and he said, you know, I feel like we probably could have saved uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars if only we had listened to our superintendent over the past four or five years because there really isn't anything new here about what the district didn't already know. Right. Um, do you think, though, that um, – well, first of all, do you, do you have any sort of sense of validation in that audit? There are some people who are already out there saying the, the audit is proof that you are uh, that, that you were uh, an incapable leader of the district, but there are some out there like the mayor last night saying it's proof that we've ignored our superintendent for five years. Um, how do you feel about what the audit said first in general, but specifically as to this question on the uh, the administrative infrastructure of the district? Well, I think the the audit nailed it. I, I really do. I th I think it truly represented. Uh, what our school district is, this where we are within uh, within a variety of areas. They had five standards that they review, and I believe they hit it right on the head in all of them. Um, the the notion, and, and again, when I read it, uh, as you know, I had the ability to read the draft before others, and uh, I'm gonna. I kept thinking to myself, oh man, this is going to be, you know, the blame game will start immediately. Well, it didn't take long before yeah. Beaudry opened his mouth at that meeting and started asking questions that were an indictment of the uh, the the administration the administration for its complaints about mismanagement. He seemed very fidgety and defensive and and uh, quick to try to deflect. Right. Uh, I guess he didn't realize that he was the one that was enabling the mass destruction of the policy that says you talk to your immediate supervisor. No, I don't we, want to put you there, Tom. No, that's all right. You know, at this point. Uh, I'm getting ready to throw my uh, cell phone in the river at uh, the 11th hour tonight uh, <laughs> or tomorrow night. So, but I will take the battery out so the environmentalists will not have to be worried about that yes, happening. Right. But I, <laughs> I thought that would be the last tangible uh, act that I could do. But it, yes, uh, I think what the auditor was trying to say, there's, you have board policy mm -hmm. and then you have how that's implemented. And the conversations around board policy are fine. I, I think that we encourage. We've always said when we bring a board policy, it is a draft. That's why you have at least two or three readings of that. But it's the uh, interference from time to time where board members actually go into the classroom and talk to people about a board policy. You know, that's to me, that's total interference and uh, and should not be allowed. And I hope the board uh, sees that and, and reacts to it appropriately. But as far as the blame game, uh, I'll take my share. Uh, I, I do think, though, when you when you work with what little we have, and I'm I'm not a guy who believes that you should always throw money at things. I really don't. I just think we need to reallocate resources. And uh, at the risk of uh, bringing up old wounds, uh, the paraprofessionals is an ex example of that, where we have over 300 paraprofessionals. There's been no data to substantiate that their work with children has caused uh, students uh, to achieve. There's nothing there. There's nothing substantial. And I believe there are other ways. We could expand our city year program to accomplish that. But that's that won't happen. The collective bargaining agreement has been signed. Paraprofessionals are locked in place. Um, it's about the adults instead of about the kids. Um, so do I share some of the blame? Of course I share some of the blame because perhaps uh, I wasn't hot enough or strong enough to say we got to stop doing this, even though I felt I had. I felt I've been saying that all along. Uh, do, you, do you wish you had drawn some battle lines publicly with the board earlier and, and really kind of brought some of your ideas or proposals forward and made them vote on them? Yes. Yes. Do, do you think that was maybe if you could if you could pick sort of a critical tactical mistake you made in developing a relationship with the board? Do you think maybe you went too far to try to accommodate them rather than confront them? Absolutely. I uh, 
I've had <laughs> several analysis done, believe it or not, uh, through leadership training and all of that. And uh, it's been clearly identified that I, I seem to exhibit a compliant attitude, which sometimes runs counter to who I think I am and what others uh, think I am. So, yes, I'd rather get, was trying to get along, you know, and that was a big, big, big mistake. And I mean it with the three bigs. Uh, Perhaps that confrontational stuff should have happened earlier, and it might have – well, two things could have happened. One, we would have been on the what I believe the right track sooner, or I would have been off the track sooner, which I wish I had done. So, so what's your advice to incoming superintendent Dr. Livingston <coughs> on how to handle the board? My first piece of advice is to spend as many hours as she can reviewing that audit because I believe as the uh, – as Dr. Um, Buckingham, I think it is Birmingham. Birmingham. Birmingham yeah. uh, indicated it was a gift to her. And uh, had I had that five years ago, it would have been a gift to me because I had a script. I had hard facts from an independent assessment. Should that should that audit, um, sh how do I put this? Should everything that's been done so far on the strategic plan, which seems to be dragging along under radar, should it just all be tossed out and should the board take this audit? that's been done and developed the strategic plan around it? I think that's their intent, Rich. I, I believe uh, Kathy Staub, uh, once she has that in her hands and then now that she does, that will become the, uh, the framework of, of the, the uh, development of the strategic plan. Because if you – I don't – you probably haven't had a chance to look at it thoroughly, but it covers everything that needs to be covered and provides what I call prescription – uh, to change. Uh, and, but th last night, even as you pointed out, we get into this whole conversation of, about the policy making. There's nothing wrong with debate around policies. What's wrong is once a policy is established, that's the policy. Right. Once the policy is established, you have to let the administration implement the policy and you have to, as a policy maker, abide by it, whether you like it or not. Correct. Tom, Jim in Manchester posts, I can't call, but can you ask Dr. Brennan if he thinks that principals and school administrators have too much auto autonomy and thank him for his service? So we'll get to that question with you, Tom, after the break, and uh, we will continue our evaluation of your time as superintendent and uh, take a look into the crystal ball and see what might be in your future. <laughs> Mama put you on the road out of bed and she ran to the police station. When the papa found out, he began to shout and started the investigation. To our large time is 24 minutes after the hour. We continue now with Manchester Superintendent Tom Brennan. So, Tom, as we were going into the break... Jim in Manchester. And by the way, if you guys want to post a question on Facebook or give us a call at 672-0573, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but Tom, Jim in Manchester asked about the autonomy of Manchester's principles. Let me let me just recap the uh, let me just recap the question again. I can't call in, but uh, can you ask Dr. Brennan if he thinks that principals and school administration have too much authority and uh, autonomy and thank him for his service? Well, Jim, thank you for that comment about my service. I appreciate that. I don't believe they have too much authority. What we lack a is auto autonomy. autonomy. Excuse me. Thank you. I misheard that. I apologize. Autonomy. Uh, oh, no, I misstated it the first time. And uh, because – they work within the rules and, 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 and try to work really hard about working with the schools. I think the real issue lies, again, pointed out in the uh, audit, was a lack of control uh, from a central office status. Uh, our principals will do what they're told to do. And if, the, if we had the capacity to ensure that they're doing it, some will, like I did when I was a uh, principal, would stretch it to the furthest extent possible. <laughs> Uh, I just heard a great phrase. It's called uh, creative insubordination. I was a pretty good person at that. Um, but what I'm getting at is uh, you can't inspect what you or do you, you can't expect what you don't inspect. And we don't have the resources, in my opinion, or the uh, particularly at the central office to go out and ensure that these things are being done. 
Now, you brought forward a, a proposal to reorganize the central office, um, what was it, two or three years ago About now? Three years ago. And what, what, what would that have done to the administration uh, infrastructure, and w- what happened to it when it got to the board? Well, it really called for the uh, structures to be divided into three segments, K to 12, uh, with uh, high schools being each at the pinnacle, and that the critical position was that of a curriculum director coordinator uh, the real rub came in where did the admin, where did the principals fall within that chain of command so I, like, if I remember correctly the principals opposed it because i had the coordinator above the principal i had the coordinator directing and in and being able to ensure what the central office and the board developed as policy was being implemented. On a system-wide basis, which yes. the audit says Manchester has got some good policies, but lousy follow-through and Correct. no capacity to monitor or enforce. So that was the, uh, I believe, the reason, and others I'm sure will call in or say something that that's not accurate, but uh, when I walked away from that not being approved, it was because uh, I had identified these curriculum experts, specialists, coordinators, whatever title we give them in education, uh, be responsible for the curriculum instruction and that the principals um, be under their control and direction. And uh, that didn't sit well. But to me, it would have made a better situation for us, both vertically and horizontally within the district, because now you have, instead of 22 people trying to say we're all doing the same thing, you really only had three working with the superintendent. And that kind of reduces your direct reports. Yes. Uh, and that was something also flagged is that you have an unusually high number of people who report to you directly or spend time with you. Correct. Like the school board. Yes. Who you report to. Correct. All right. So if we uh, take a look now, what, what are some of the things, Tom, that you wish that you had accomplished that you, that you didn't get to or didn't pass or whatever the situation was? I believe I I wish I had been able to be more successful in establishing a stronger foundation with the pre-K to three. Uh, I keep talking about it, but nothing seems to come out of that. It seems like you got your way on the the, the teacher allocations with the the new budget. So far. So far, Uh, yeah. (laughs) That's right. Uh, Well, is that a problem, though, in the district? Is is the constant refighting battles that have already been decided and yes. instead of moving on to something new we gotta we gotta go back and try to win what we lost yes over and over and over again yes and i also believe that uh, because of the culture here and people always work within the culture and to their advantage whenever possible is that once a decision's made we don't allow enough time for it to run its course and right People, whether they be teachers, paraprofessionals, or principals, administrators, will uh, express their dismay of that current idea or policy to a board member who will then bring it to, back to the table. And, you know, the, I, well, I've talked to seven, seven or several principals. They don't like it. Well, you know, they should talk to me about that. And even if they don't like it, too Tough. bad. Well, you can't make everybody happy. I know. And, and you know, that's, that's another frustration. But I think that if I could have done that, and the, at the so-called uh, beginning. And the other thing was to somehow break through to our high school personnel, uh, mainly administrators and counselors, that it's okay to learn outside of school. It's okay to get credit outside of school. So is that really, at the end of the day, was that really a union thing, feeling threatened by, you know, things that um, might lead to a reduced need for them? I think it uh, – I, I wouldn't throw it in with the union because I think it was a fear by everyone that eventually I could lose my job. And my my response to that is no, you'd be able to work with the kids that really need your work, need your help. Uh, somehow in education, we've gotten to a point where we only want to work with the uh, majority. I shouldn't say that. Majority of teachers only want to work with those kids who are motivated, those kids who are uh, – academically uh, at a higher level, whose parents are involved in all of that. They want the cream of the crop. Right. And and to me, a true educator wants the other end. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll, I'll probably embarrass her, but uh, Mr. Corovo's mother, B. Corovo, was a teacher that I worked with. Uh, Alderman Corovo uh, from Ward 6. Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, at Conant High School. 
And she was the best English teacher and has been with maybe exception of Selma uh, that I've ever worked with. And she always insisted on working with so-called lower level students every year. And she was she could have had the cream of the crop. And uh, what she did uh, was to keep herself in balance and keep her kids in balance. And uh, that's what I think is missing now is that everybody, everyone wants the best. But aren't we charged with the responsibility of educating those who need our help? And that's what uh, at the secondary level I think should have happened and could happen. So not, not enough effort trying to reach the kids for whom, say, the four walls of a classroom might not be ideal. Correct. And, and also you look at our dual credit. One good thing we have in terms of policies are the uh, policies that allow learning to take place outside of the classroom, extended learning opportunity, dual credit, uh, what's called alternative credit, uh, online learning. These are things that if we would just take advantage of, we could have students actually have a year, up to a year of college credit at the end of their high school career and still meet all of the requirements of their high school diploma, plus have a year done, you know, without any payment. And we don't, we don't make that happen. And the colleges are ready to make that happen. They want to work with us, but it's hard to change that. Now, your uh, your tenor has not been bereft of accomplishment. What would you no. say? <laughs> no, it what, hasn't. I what, guess you're right. <laughs> what, what, what would you say, um, what, what are some of the things that you'll look back on uh, proudly and say, you know, I, I helped get that started or we created this or the district did that? What what, what are some of those things? Well, I, I again go back to the policies around uh, learning outside of the classroom. Uh, MST, the four-year program, uh, I think is going to be if allowed to grow, uh, is something i would be very, very proud of. Uh, the expansion of uh, working with the mayor and the, the expansion of city year into our school district, uh, that would be another, another piece. Uh, and not somewhat external to education, but the development of strong relationships with the police, fire, all, all the city uh, agencies. I think we have a very strong relationship. Oh, that's, really? You mean Alderman O'Neill uh, got it wrong when he kept beating you about the head for allegedly not communicating with them and developing security priorities when all you were trying to do was get intercoms fixed? Uh, I believe we did more than the Alderman indicated, and we have done more. <laughs> And they call me a politician. Well, you're, you know, show, you're showing your good grace and uh, and restraint, uh, Mr. Superintendent. I, know, <laughs> I probably I shouldn't be dangling these things in well, front of you. It, it, it doesn't accomplish much. I mean, I may have a second of, yeah, I said that. But uh, in the long run, I, I really only care about what happens to our kids. And I I guess that's the other thing. I, I don't think we've been the, uh, I did not do a very good job of representing what I wear on my lapel in, in terms of ensuring that it was all about kids first. And now, so, why do you say you didn't do a good job at that? Is, you, know, you made a statement earlier in the interview that it needs to be about the, the kids in the building, or not right. the adults or, or some such thing. Is, right. is it your opinion that the Manchester School District or the Board of School Committee or whoever um, cares more about those people collecting a paycheck than the, the, the children they're charged with educating? I believe the focus of our educational system, not only in Manchester, but throughout the country, is adult-based and, and not children-based or child-based. Uh, no. With all the things we have in place between unions and rules, and it, it's what's best for the teacher. If You think unionization has hurt education? Initially, no. Currently, yes. Uh, and as I said, I think it was last night or the I said something in the last couple of days – I respect the people that work in representing the unions, uh, Ben Dick being one who I really respect. Yeah, Ben's a good guy. He is. Uh, but what I don't, what I struggle with is the fact of the rules that uh, when you know something's wrong, you know there's not something happening in classrooms that we can't act on it immediately. Uh, I always joked about, and it's a somewhat uh, serious comment, is uh, I believe a majority of Teachers who fall within the union mindset want white collar respect, but blue collar protection. And there's something wrong with that. There's, if you know there's something wrong with it, and I know there's something wrong with it, uh, 
we should be able to act immediately, unlike corporations. Well, one of the, and I know you've listened to those interviews in the past, but one of the things I've challenged Ben on is where is the voice of the union Ben when it when it's come from everything to uh, curriculum to special ed to violence in the classroom? Why do we only hear from them during times of budget and contract negotiations and anything else? And he said, well, you know, we do a lot of that behind the scenes. He said, but you know, what do you want me to do? Run the district too? I said, well, you know, we always talk about the professionals in, in, the, in the classroom and, and their expertise and experience. Why isn't that being brought into the public dialogue by the union? Does that, am, I, am I alone out there on an island with that thought? Are they advocates behind the scenes? Are they below radar? Or should they take a more public role, in your opinion, addressing some of the policy issues that affect their ability to do the job, especially the state and national ones that really handcuff us here at the local level? Well, I think Ben is correct in, in one aspect as far as a lot of conversations, so-called behind closed doors, trying to work within the system to get it to work uh, better, uh, particularly in the area of safety. But I also, the other side of that coin, uh, I guess I'm old enough now that when I worked in, worked with the mostly disturbed children and if they bit me or scratched me or did what they did because of, not out of uh, malice, but because who they were and what they were going through, I never said anything about it. I, I, I just that was my job. That's what I was expected to do. Um, but you know, to have it categorized as assaults and everything else, I think we're going a little over the top. Uh, but I also believe, as I said, I was speaking at the chamber yesterday. Uh, we all need to get down into the muck and mire of education and stand up and say, "This is wrong. Let's let's uh, address what should be done." And I'm. I'm just as guilty of uh, getting back to that compliant piece that really bothers me. I found myself being more compliant than outspoken and more direct. Did you just maybe start to come to a, a place of futility in your mindset, like yeah. you're banging your head against the wall and the only way to make it stop hurt is to stop banging? Yeah, I think so. I, uh, yes, going to those meetings, as I tell people, I love my day job. I can't, can't stand my night job. And my night job being meetings uh, that are televised and allow for uh, allow a forum for conversation. I remember my first year here, I kept saying to the board, when do we talk? When do we talk? And, and what I meant by that was have honest conversation without being uh, mean spirited or accusatory and, you know, the administration. Well, you know. If it's the superintendent, say it's the superintendent. If it's the assistant superintendent, say it's the assistant superintendent. Wait, this whole thing. So, yeah, I, I think, uh, as I said, I was 6'2 when I started the job. But, you know, <laughs> you know I, I say the same joke yeah. about working for Ray Wazorek. I tell people I was a strapping 6'2, 185 when I started in this city, and here I am at 5'7, 30 pounds lighter. All right, uh, we're going to continue with Superintendent Brennan when we come back. We're going to take a look at uh, what he thinks about the community. Is it anti-education? What's the future of the district? Where does he see it going Where to, versus where it could go? And uh, we'll find out what's in his personal future. Plus, we have a teacher with a post up on Gerard at Large. We'll share that right when we come back. David Howard Rhodes. Up in the morning and out for two. The teacher is teaching the golden rule. American history and practical man. All right. Dry large time is 18 minutes. We're going to get right to it. George Aravantis, A-R-A-V-A-N-I-T-I-S, writes, I would be for online learning if the students had to go to a facility to take exams at a facility like a Prometrics, a, a Prometheus lab. Friends of my sons have taken VLAX courses and had two computers open, looked up the answer on one, entered the answer on the other. I'm truly skeptical that students are really learning. Mr. Superintendent. I don't see much difference than what happens today in a classroom. What happened in the day when I was... Uh, looking on somebody else's test paper? They were actually looking on my paper. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I mean, you can point to all of these uh, outliers like that and... Uh, that's one of the things about America, I guess. Everyone looks for the creative re resolution. To me, it's the matter of getting it done and understanding it. Mm -hmm. I think we spend too much time in curriculum, scope and sequencing it. 
I'm a big competency person. I, I believe very strongly if you can demonstrate that you have that knowledge, whether it's uh, doing a project or doing something else, that that's what it's about, not simply sit seat work for 150 hours. And, you know, I would love to have our kids who are tested in a classroom take their midterm exam and then test them six weeks later. Give them the same midterm exam and see what happens. Mm. See if there's any real retention. Uh, probably not. Well, then let's get over this a little bit in terms of, you know, all of this uh, – this need for complete control and security and all of this stuff. Uh, you're really getting me today. So I'm going to get really out there. I, I think it's a farce. I think we've had our educational system where teachers, you know, we're talking about common core off offline here a few moments ago and about standards and other things. And what is the metric that we use that that is consistent now in our public education teacher in room 103 and teacher in 102 teaching the same subject cover different components of it, put emphasis in different places, scored differently. Uh, and, and yet we said that's OK. And then we say uh, school X is sending I'm um, transferring from school X to school Y. And we just because it says algebra one, they passed, we give them credit. We don't know what what that person learned in that algebra one. We don't know if they're accelerated or where, where are we? Um, most school districts in the country are going away from tracking. So once you get off this level one to level four thing, it, algebra one. So what does that mean? And I, I just think all I'm saying in terms of uh, online learning and internet learning, whatever you want to call it, we should just be giving kids opportunities, different opportunities. Some kids may really do well in that. Some kids may need to be in the classroom. Some kids could go to a business and learn. Just open up our minds and our doors. That's how I feel. Is Manchester anti-education? We've heard a lot said by certain so-called pro-school groups about uh, what a bunch of retrograde Neanderthals Manchester's people are because they won't override the tax cap and they're too cheap to fund their schools, et cetera, et cetera. Do you consider the parents and the taxpayers of the city of Manchester – to be uninterested or otherwise hostile to education? I consider them to be uneducated about education. And I'm not avoiding your question. I, I think we, we should have, uh, they should have a better idea what comes out of our schools in terms of, of what goes on in our schools. I also believe that uh, they, it's been undervalued and it's been undervalued because we have so many things going on that we don't have enough time to go out and tell people what's actually happening. Uh, and I look, I'm sorry. Let's go ahead. Well, well, just to look at the central office and everyone says, well, he's from the central office. He wants more people. I just want enough people to get the job done. When that audit comes out and there'll be people, as I said earlier, will start the blame game. This wasn't done. This wasn't done. This wasn't done. Then who was going to do that? I'd ask them. You know, I jokingly said a couple of years ago, I took away all the plates from administrators and gave them platters because we have more and more and more things to do. And it seems like we're getting further and further away from education in the things that we have to do. Uh, discipline uh, in the schools. I, I have talked about we don't need an assistant principal in charge of discipline. We have a person with a master's degree walking around the building with little pieces of paper trying to track down David or someone. And, and all we really need is someone who can track down David and then report you know, to David, you ever better get to school. And if he <coughs> fails to do that, then we pass it up the chain. But in my opinion, you could pick up two, at least two people. In Los Angeles, they call them trackers. But two people to do that work at less cost. And probably be more efficient at it. It's a matter of allocation, and it's very difficult to break tradition and ritual in edu public education. Mm -hmm. That's that's the trouble. But I, I uh, part of the trouble. Um, I do think there should be more uh, dedicated, but I also think that uh, we should be better in how we allocate our resources. Well, and to that point, do you think the citizens and taxpayers of Manchester have a right to be cynical about the idea that spending more money will fix the problem, since they haven't always been the skin flints they're being accused of, and they haven't really seen the results that they were promised. Why, you know, 
and, and we've spoken. I mean, mm-hmm. there are 20 year old decisions that are finally being made by the school board because the tax cap forced it. That's correct. Why shouldn't the taxpayers be cynical of the school board and the, the, the district in general for its failure to adapt, adjust and accommodate as it went and have that laser focus on figuring out how to do it better? Well, I think you're right in that assessment. I think that people have a right to be cynical. And I, I know I'm putting a lot of on this on this uh, audit, but I think the audit's going to help focus that what we lacked not only under my administration, but previous administrations, uh, is a strategy and a plan and a prescription. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe uh, Dr. Livingston will be able to have a prescription through this plan, and that will help her because it's not only just the administration that's being addressed, but the Board of School Committee is being addressed. Are you concerned that she's not going to get much of a honeymoon? And, And the reason why I'm raising that is, there was a kerfuffle at the school board over posting the assistant superintendent's position. And certain members of the board, I think it was Beaudry and Langton, didn't want to post it because they wanted to wait until she had a chance to assess and do this and do that. And you said, I've spoken to Dr. Livingston. She wants the position filled. Um, we should post it. And still they opposed it. Are, are you worried that she's uh, in for the barrel treatment, to, at least by some? My uh, candid belief is they just didn't want me to have anything to do with it. And if you could delay that, that would be better. Uh, The only conversation I had with Dr. Livingston was, here's the timeline. Should that be changed? And she said, yes. Uh, I have not talked to her about the type of person should be there. I will not talk about anything unless she asks me a question. But, uh, between those two individuals, I've not had the best relationship, and uh, I don't think there's very much trust there. Uh, I believe uh, at least one of them would have rather had a clean, entirely clean sweep of that SAU office, mm-hmm. uh, with the exception of Mrs. Uh, Miss DeFrancis. Um, so, uh, no, I, I just think they thought I was influencer in her, and I, I have stayed so far away from this. It, it's incredible, but it's uh, that's I what I believe. You didn't even return my calls for comment after that's she right. was named. I didn't. That's right. That's and how far away he stayed from it. I did, and I, I think it's appropriate. But as far as the honeymoon, um, I think she'll have a honeymoon with the majority of the board. What, what happens when recommendations she brings forward sound an awful lot like recommendations you brought forward? Do you think the board – how does the board react to that? Because uh, – you know, if she sounds starts sounding like you, do they come to grips with the fact that there are just things that need to be done? Um, have you cast a magic spell on her? And <laughs> she should be, uh, you know, exercised to the evil demons and spirits. What what happens when that happens? Well, I suspect in some cases it's going to. I would I would think so. And uh, but again, I'm going to be able to use the audit as that okay. that difference maker uh, because the audit talks about things we've been talking about for a while. Uh, And Dr. Livingston is an independent thinker. She will uh, decide what is appropriate for the district based on what her knowledge is. And having this audit will allow her to do that. As far as the Board of School Committee, I would say a significant majority of them will want to see that plan implemented. And they'll want to see the leadership provided by Dr. Livingston to get it done. And there will be a minority who will object to the sun coming up tomorrow. A <laughs> couple uh, quick, quick hits. Mayor Ted Gatsis, a central role or a central figure, not only in the city, but certainly on the school board. Um, you've been accused of being his puppet and lackey. You've called him your boss. You did that before the Charter Commission. Uh, is he a constructive force on the board? Oh, I think he. Uh, yes, I, I, I believe he is. Uh, his personality from time to time, uh, because he is so passionate about the city and, and about schools, uh, does seem to um, irritate some people. But uh, I, I believe his, his, he's honestly and, and truly cares about education. We just at that time have disagreements about how we go about doing that. And it's not always as simple as one plus one equals two. And uh, he's a very... Uh, impatient person uh, compared to those of us who work in education. Uh, But uh, he cares. And 
as I said one time, I, I, someone would accuse me of being in his pocket, and I said, you know what, I'll be in his pocket, I'll be on his back, I'll be on his shoulders as long as it helps kids in our school district. And he really cares about that. He, But he also is pretty rigid about tax caps and other things and believes strongly that money isn't always the answer, which I believe also. Mm-hmm. But somehow we have to get to the level playing field. We're not at a, a, a school approval level yet. Just get us there. And then we can go from there. But I, I respect the mayor. Uh, we seem they, everyone thinks he's a bully to me. Uh, we have our disagreements. We have our conversations. But uh, I think he's thinking what's right for the school district. I just don't know if some of these ideas are the ones that would be work best for our district. The uh, future of the district mm-hmm. and the future of Tom Brennan. What, uh, what do you see as the future for this district? What do you, what do you think its way forward is? And uh, where are you off to now? And by the way, you get uh, about 90 seconds to answer both. Both. Okay. <laughs> so doing everyday math, that's 45 seconds. Okay. Um, no. Um, I hope everyday to. Math. <laughs> oh, I got to throw that in there. Uh, I, I would like to continue in education. I would uh, – I've always talked about writing a book about what I think edu- where education is and where it should be. I hope to do some liaison work with the Department of Education and spend more time with my grandchildren and, and my family. But, I think uh, a lot of people don't know this. You live up in New London. Yes. And uh, you actually have been renting for five years an apartment in Manchester so yes. you could spend your time here. You see your wife on weekends yes. sometimes. Yes, except for, so she retired in January 31st, and we came down to live in the apartment, and we kept bumping into one another. <laughs> you know? but, uh, so, yeah. I mean, I mean, you've really put your family on the back burner to uh, to be the superintendent of this district. Unfortunately, uh, Rich, I think I've done that throughout my administrative career. Mm-hmm. Uh, fortunately, I am blessed with a, a wife and four lovely daughters who uh, understood where I was and what I was trying to accomplish. As far as where the district goes, I believe this audit, you know, every, everyone talks about the silver bullet. I don't know if it's a silver bullet or not, but it, it has maybe the dust thing could work with this one that being sprinkled around. And if they follow it and they just live up to it, will they? Um, I'm doing we- more yes than I would have two years ago, just with the makeup of the board. But then again, what happens in November? Mm-hmm. All right. So that's I I'm op- more optimistic about the district than I was a year ago. Superintendent Tom Brennan, I uh, appreciate the time that you've spent with us here on our adorable little radio show. I certainly appreciate your service to the city of Manchester. Uh, working for the city is often <laughs> often a thankless proposition, no matter who you are or where you do it. And uh, I want to thank you for. Um, really your efforts to try to change education. If nothing else, you started a lot of discussions and showed a lot of different possibilities. And hopefully the district, uh, uh, as it moves forward, will end up vindicating a lot of what you had to say. As long as it works for the kids, I don't care who gets vindicated. All right. Superintendent Tom Brennan, thank you for joining us here on a very special interview with Gerard at Large. We wish you all the best in the future. And uh, I still have your cell phone number unless it belongs to the district. It which- doesn't belong to the district, and it will be in the bottom of the Merrimack. <laughs> So good luck with that one. (laughs) DJ Dave. Thank you very much, Rich. Thank you.